Well, let's imagine that you enter inside the bar and you see somebody grasping a glass of beer. So you immediately will understand what he's doing. And according to how he's grasping, you probably can understand also his intention. So if he grasps like that, it's very unlikely that this guy is going to drink. Well, how we do that? I think the classical point of view is uh, that we simply describe visually what's going on, and then there is a kind of uh, mechanism which somehow put together this element and give us the answer. So we, as a person, we are not involved. There is just a mechanism we do it. The other way is here, which automatically came outside. This is the, the idea of Husserl, Merleau-Ponty, Sartre, and many others, which we understand the thing, not because we must do this uh, logical inference, but because when we observe an action of somebody, it, there is a mechanism through which his action became part of our action. In other words, sensory information is automatically transformed in a motor program. So Merleau-Ponty said the sense of gesture. Is not I think the advantage of this, because somehow put the person together with the guy who is doing the thing. So there is a matching. We, we heard something from Andy Mance of this morning, and okay, we'll come back on this point. But anyway, so that's the point of phenomenologists. But most philosophers said, well, uh, phenomenologists, phenomenologists are like poets. They invented these nice uh, things, but there is no scientific basis. So what we discovered a few years ago, that there is a scientific basis, there is a mechanism called the mirror mechanism, which actually transforms sensory information into motor program. Before speaking about this mechanism, which is called a mirror mechanism, few words about the motor system. What you see here is the lateral view of the brain and also the medial part. And you see we have many premotor areas. So it's not a kind of monolith as it was taught 20 or 25 years ago. If you look in the Mount Castle textbook of 30 years ago, it seems that there are motor cortex, supplementary cortex, and it's very interesting. In the same book is written, we don't know how it's the relation between the motor system and the rest of the brain. Anyway, now we know a lot about that. And my interest was especially in one of these areas, which is area F5. So recording from area 5, we have several surprises. The first is this area was not coding movement, but motor act. What's the difference between movement and motor act? If I stimulate with TMS my brain, I will see this, these are movement. And movement are, these are movement. But these movements are typically organized together in order to reach a goal. So this is grasping. There is movement of several fingers, but what it's the final thing is grasping. So if you look at these slides here, it's clear there are not movements uh, rec um, coded in the promoter cortex, because in this case, the grasping is done with the mouth, with the right hand, and with the left hand. So it's clearly a completely different set of movement. So that's, I think it was an extremely important concept, the coding of motor goal inside the motor cortex. Well, the other surprise was that many of these neurons responded also to visual stimuli. At the beginning, we found those neurons which are now called canonical neurons. So if you have a neurons which respond to this type of movement, often the same type of neuron responds if you show a seed or a small object. If the neuron code what is called a whole hand grip, the presentation of an apple, will produce a response. So it was a transformation from the size and shape of the object into a particular motor act, something which probably Gibson would like very much. Anyhow, the, the other discovery which was more surprising was in some cases was not sufficient to grasp an object or to show an object to a person, to a monkey, but it was necessary to show the action on it. So object per se was not enough, but an action was sufficient provided that, that, that those neurons have some property to trigger the neuron. I think the best thing, I will show two mirror neurons, and you will understand immediately all the story. First one. What you see here, it's a grasping neuron. So it fires when the monkey grasps. You see how repetitive it is. We don't need statistics, histograms. It's, it's there. 
Here is the same neuron, but now it's the vision of this neuron which produces the discharge. Thank you. Thank you. It doesn't matter if it's the monkey grasping or the person is grasping. You understand why? Because the goal is the same, it's grasping. Okay, now another mirror neuron. In this case, please pay attention to the inhibition. These neurons have very high spontaneous activity. What counts is the inhibition. You see, any time the object is grasped, it's signaled to, to the brain where it is. Nothing. Why is nothing? Because it's not grasping. It's simply the object disappear from the scene. Okay. So you see from this that mirror neurons are easy to trigger when they are there. They are highly repetitive, and they describe a specific action. They describe uh, bringing to the mouth, grasping, tearing, and so on. So when we discovered what we thought of it, we thought imitation. And I think, I still believe that for face, I think it's imitation. But for hands, it's very unlikely that it's imitation because if you speak with pathologists, they all tell, tell you that uh, monkeys do not imitate with their hand. They have no capacity to learn by imitation. So we thought that maybe there is a more basic, older mechanism, and that's action understanding. We did several experiments to prove it. I have no time to tell you. But the basic idea was if we change completely the scenario and still the monkey can understand the action, although he cannot see it, it, that will be a good proof in favor of our hypothesis. Here it's, for example, one experiment we published some years ago on science, in which you see that S, when only the sound describing a, a typical movement, a movement was presented to the monkey, the discharge was there. So in other words, think that you are in your hotel and you hear uh, walking somebody, you understand that somebody is walking, although you don't see. So this type of stimuli are effective for now, when we discovered mirror neurons, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of enthusiasm, especially journalists wrote, oh, well, now we have a set of neurons which tell what is going on in the brain, you understand the things. No, that's completely wrong. When the mirror neurons fire, they simply, it's a transformation, transform sensory information into activation of a great number of neurons. Some of them are in the premotor cortex, the other in the basal ganglia. Recently, Roger Lemon described neurons which go from the cortex to the spinal cord. So what happens, you have a motor schema which is general and correspond to the other one. Mirror neurons are not magic, but they are simply an element which transforms sensory information into a complex motor pattern. And this complex motor pattern is similar to the one that we use when we do an action. Uh, single neurons are, I think, the best technique if one wants to learn something about mechanism, but of course, fMRI is the way in which you can see the circuit. Here is an experiment done in the monkey with a three Tesla, and you see that when you present action to a monkey, uh, there are three regions active, essentially. STS, inferior parietal lobe, and premotor cortex, including some part of the prefrontal lobe. And here it's something more complicated. It's a synthesis of this work. One point here is important, that the blue line starts also from the inferotemporal cortex. So when you do an action, you have information about the size, shape, but you have also information about the semantics. And that's, I think, is very important when you have to grasp an object. Well, at this point, why STS is not enough? That's what we have been asking from the very beginning. STS is a very complicated area. It's 
beautiful area, but why is not enough? Well, I think several reasons. One reason that visual area cannot describe simultaneous two different goals. If you describe grasp with the right hand, you cannot have also with the left hand. You cannot have the mouth. So visual stimuli are extremely important, but they describe the status of art, what is going on now. But they cannot say anything about generalization. And in my view, to say that a system understands things, it means that it's able to generalize. So the motor system is able to generalize. I think that's why the evolution invented mirror neurons, goal generalization. The other thing which has been already suggested by Marc Genero is that the, vi the motor system gives you an idea about the future. So when you see something visually, you see what is here, but you cannot predict what is going in the future. So this is an experiment which we did with uh, Fogassi in which uh, the monkey was trained in this case to bring an object, to take an object and bring either to the mouth or to put in the container. So there were two options. So you see there were a set of neurons, like Unix 67, which was firing for grasping. Always the same movement, always grasping, but the intention it's completely different. Uh, look, that's an important concept because we, we don't grasp the thing for sake of grasping. We grasp the thing because we have an intention to drink or to give a friend or to throw away. So this type of information is coded in this neuron and Unit 67 fire when we grasp, uh, the monkey grasp in order to eat. Unit 161, vice versa, and so on. One can think, well, that's a crazy way to lose neurons. Why so many neurons for grasping has to be there? But I think from these slides you can see so uh, grasping for uh, eating is very important because it helps you to do the second movement. So you grasp, but since your intention is to eating, you have a long discharge which allows you to have a fluid, uh, uh, a fluid movement, nothing in the other. Many of these neurons have also mirror properties. So they fire not when the monkey is grasping, when the experimenter is grasping, either to put here, we can put some trick, block design, give inf immediate information to the monkey what's going on. But what is interesting here, because we, we have here a very elementary mechanism to explain a very important function, the understanding of intention of others. So I don't claim that you can understand from mirror neurons if somebody is drinking coffee because he wants to show something to a girl or because he wants to have caffeine and so on. But the intention is very clear. If he grasping a certain way, you can predict. And that's kind of basic level of intention, which can be applied, uh, by the way, to robots probably. Well, what about humans? We have plenty of evidence that mirror neuron exists in humans. has been quoted by Andy experiment on the Mu rhythm in the cortex. Uh, it's a typical motor uh, rhythm which they synchronize also when you see action. There is a lot of experiment with TMS, which again showed that there is increase of, ac of activation, of excitability of the motor cortex when you see somebody grasping. And then there is hundreds of neurons of MRI. That's not mine, the next one. But it's a work made in Germany, in Germany, Zurich. It's a review article which takes into consideration 125 papers. And if you look at the areas which are active, are exactly the same as the monkey. So evolution has not changed my much. Again, STS, parietal lobe, premotor cortex, and frontal lobe. Well, uh, there are, as I said, a lot of experiments with fMRI. I want to show one old one, which I think explains also the limit of the mirror neurons. Here it's an experiment done, fMRI experiment. We put in the scanner a student, and the student saw this video, either a student uh, biting a piece of food, or the monkey doing the same thing, or the dog doing it. In the second part of the experiment, it was a communicative gesture. So the student saw so another student reading, student in the scanner saw so a student reading a newspaper. It was silent, no, no sound. The monkey was making lip smacking and the dog was barking. So here are the results. For biting, look at the left hemisphere. There's practically no difference. So biting done by an animal or bite by us is understood the same way. We feel like the animal in the same way. Uh, in the right hemisphere, there are some differences, but of course the visual aspect of our face, of the dog face, so are different. Co the picture is completely different when you see an oral communication. In this case, uh, the human being, when they hear 
happen. You see the huge Broca's area activation and so on. For the monkey, there is this small red spot in the promoter cortex in Broca's area. For dog, is nothing. Why nothing? Well, because we, we don't know what it means barking. We are unable to bark. We can say bow, bow, ha, bow, but we, we don't know what it means. I mean, barking implies an emotional, a, a particular. So mirror neurons are limited in the sense that allow us to understand what we know already, what we already learned to do. Uh, if something we don't know, it's other. So I am not a Taliban saying, mirror neurons explain everything. <laughs> there are other mechanisms, mentalizing, which allow you to reason and to be Sherlock Holmes. So in some case, you cannot be Husserl, but you must be Sherlock Holmes. Okay, now, so the mirror mechanism is a basic mechanism. It's the transformed sensory representation into a motor format. It's localized in multiplicity of cortical areas and neural center. It's present in the bird, for example, recently has been shown present in the bird. And it has different functions according to where it's located. To conclude, I want to show the experiment of emotion, which is not new. So the experiment was done in the following way. We gave to student, again, fMRI experiment, different, different odorants and particularly effective were bad odorant, rotten eggs, for example, the odorant is extremely strong. And we look at which area became active when you give this natural stimuli. In the second part of the experiment, they look at, at people which express the same emotion. So he, you see here, uh, on the left side are uh, amygdala, but I don't care about that because it's not activated by observation of, of faces. On the right side, you see in the insula, there are several spots. But the most interesting part is here. So here it's clear that the same voxel are active both when I feel disgust and when I see somebody with disgust. Subsequently, other people demonstrate the same is true for pain. So it's not a kind of rational deduction. If somebody sends me an emoticon with a face which is laughing, I will understand it's laughing, but I have no emotion. But I see some accident, if I am not a psychopath, I will feel a strong emotion. But the important point that we feel emotion in the same part of the brain, so it's my, em my emotion, it's your emotion. We share emotion. It's not two different things and then I say, oh yes, it's somehow similar to you and so on. It's like me. Well, I want to finish with this sentence by Adam Smith, the big, uh, the great economist, the founder of economy. Before uh, writing his book about the wealth of nations, he wrote, how selfish soever men may be supposed, there are evidently some principle in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Mm -hmm. So I think this is very optimistic, but I think it's basically true. I think when you think about our social behavior, you have always remembered we have basic or we have uh, some uh, mechanism, physiological mechanism, basic physiological mechanism, and then there is an influence of society. So the two interact. It's very rare that something win completely. So we are born with the capacity really to be to interest in the fortune of others and uh, are happy when they are happy. But of course, if society tells you, you must be egoistic and you have to hate the other people, probably this mechanism became less and less strong. So what about, I have still one minute, what about the future? Uh, I think we have two pathways here in my research. One pathway is, it's, I don't know how to do it, but somehow to reinforce this mechanism with some psychological, maybe art, I, I have no idea. I'm just putting here the idea. But how to reinforce this natural tendency that we have to be like the other people. And I think here Andy and other people agree with me that we have this strong tendency. You behaviorally, you have demonstrated before us. The other thing is if we could find some drug or something of this kind, we'd improve it. In this case, however, I should move from my favorite primates to rodents. And uh, I tried, but I have no communication with rodents, <laughs> with the monkey. You speak with the monkey, you move, f but with rodents. So it should be really a specific project in which some specialist of uh, physiology rodents mm -hmm. and also methodologists, because I am using grasping, because we and monkey grasp objects, but also rats are able to grasp, but uh, I don't know if the same grasping is ours. Okay, thank you.